I would say if you're a beginner, you can train three days a week, full body, go all out and see how you feel. And you should be able to recover just fine, even if you're 40 or 50 or 60. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another solo episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. I hope you enjoyed our last episode 89 with Dr. Ryan Peebles, where we talked about lower back pain, how to reverse it through movement, and how to recover from low back pain injuries, prevent them, and improve your back health. Today for episode 90, we are doing a Q&A. We're going to answer 11 questions on everything from calorie tracking to how often should you weigh yourself to building muscle over 40 and lots more nutrition related questions. So let's just get into that. First question. I work out six days a week and eat healthy, but I've never tracked my calories or even know how much I weigh. Should I keep track of this if my goal is just to be healthy overall and be lean? So this is an interesting question because it's not just about health. It's also being lean. Now this person is working out six days a week. I don't know if that's too much, too little. You know, oftentimes I see people overdoing it with their workouts and we oftentimes dial it back. Um, especially if you're a newer or intermediate lifter, we're looking at three or four days a week of lifting. And then the other days for recovery or some light work and definitely lots of walking. And this person is wondering if they should track to be healthy and lean. Now, Although caloric balance and weight are components of health, they're not the only ones, right? We have all the other aspects of what we're trying to do here, including uh, what you eat to manage things like hunger and whatnot, um, your training routine, you know, are you lifting heavy, um, and what your ultimate goal is, right? But if you want to optimize your body composition, I think it's going to be important to track and weigh yourself regularly. And the reason is they are objective measures. They are data points that will give you more information more quickly to assess your progress, to adjust your intake, and to optimize your results. Think of it as a simple feedback loop. If you don't have the data coming in, in terms of the feedback, you have no idea what to change going forward. Now, if you're not tracking calories, you still have some data coming in, but if you're not tracking your weight, That data is basically how you look in the mirror, how you feel and things like that. And that may be enough for you. But if you want to get lean and you want to do it effectively and quickly, and what I always like to tell people is when you get lean, we're talking about a fat loss phase. These are no fun. Um, They're not a walk in the park. And I'd rather you get them done as quickly and effectively as possible. Not a crash diet, but uh, efficiently within the range that allows you to support and um, preserve your lean muscle, but as quickly as you can. If you track, if you're not tracking your calories, you don't know how much energy you're consuming. You just don't. You also don't know how much you're expending because you need to know how much you're eating plus how much your weight is changing over time to know how much you're expending. And this changes every day. And so how do you keep track of how much you need to eat? Do you eat more or less next Monday? What about the following week? More or less? Okay. And if you're just kind of going by the seat of your pants and how you look, it's going to take a long time to get that right. So you might under eat one week, you might overeat one week. All of these, they affect your performance and they affect your body composition. Just think about performance. If you one week are under eating and you don't realize it, you may all of a sudden not be able to lift as much in the gym. That's going to affect your ability to build muscle or preserve muscle, right? So they're all intertwined. You may not get enough nutrients to sort your recovery, your hormones, your immune system. This could lead to fatigue, to injury, to illness, muscle loss, um, even some metabolic adaptation when you didn't mean to. If you're overeating, you may gain unwanted body fat, which is just going to slow down you getting lean, obviously. Um, And of course, just gaining extra fat that you don't want is not great for things like chronic disease and inflammation and insulin resistance and all those, which then makes it harder for you to achieve a lean physique. So by tracking your calories, you know that you're eating enough to fuel your performance and support your health, and you're not eating too much that you gain excess fat, and then you can tweak. You can adjust your calories. Okay, I need to I need to be in a certain deficit to lose fat, or I need to be a certain surplus to gain muscle. Also, and here's I think the more important thing, tracking your calories, especially if you've never done it, will teach you so much about your eating habits, the caloric content of your food, the macro breakdown nutrients, right? The macronutrient breakdown, uh, the micronutrient breakdown, which all helps you feedback to make better food choices and improve your nutrition quality. That's the irony of this whole thing is so many diets are about eating this, not that, or clean foods versus these foods, whole foods versus processed foods. 
But as soon as you start tracking and you see what you eat, you start making those adjustments pretty quickly to serve your goals. And that actually leads to a sustainable approach to higher food quality. The other thing is weighing yourself. If you don't weigh yourself regularly, you have no idea how your weight is changing over time. Okay. And this also makes it difficult to evaluate progress and see if you're moving toward your goal. Um, pretty obvious if you're trying to lose fat and you don't weigh yourself, you may not know that you're gaining weight or that you're hitting a plateau. And by the time you do, you've wasted several weeks, if not months of time. And then you don't make the changes that you need to, to your, your diet, your training and so on to break through the plateau. And then the opposite case for trying to gain muscle. So if you weigh yourself regularly, you can monitor the trend over time. Okay. And I like to use macro factor as a food logging app and also as a weight logging app. And by taking both the food and the weight, you know how your body, you're, you know how much you're expending every day, you how many calories you're burning every day, and then you know exactly what you need to eat. Okay. You can also correlate this with other things, photos, measurements, right? How you feel, how you look, your biofeedback, and all of these give you the big picture. So I would weigh and track your calories, or I would track your calories and weigh yourself regularly. If you're trying to be lean and healthy, they give you valuable feedback and they keep you accountable and motivated because they show you the results of your hard work right there in cold, hard numbers. And again, they're not the only factors, right? You have stress, you have your hydration, you have things like your digestion, lifestyle, sleep, and so on. So that's my somewhat long answer to that first question. Okay, getting to the second question. How many protein shakes do you recommend a day if you aren't that big of a meat eater? I have to supplement constantly. So this person isn't saying that they are vegan or vegetarian, but that would be kind of the extreme of this question. They're just saying they don't eat that much meat. So if we think about how much protein we need, the recommendation is generally, if you want to optimize, if you're worried about body composition and building muscle, is 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound. So if you're 180 pounds, you need somewhere around 140 to 180 or more grams of protein. So even if we're on the lower end of that, around 140, and you have, let's say, three meals and one or two snacks, each of those meals is going to be around 40 grams of protein, and the snacks are each going to be around 20 or 30. So I would say it's almost inevitable that at least one of those snacks needs to be a protein shake. So it's not only you're asking me how many do you recommend a day, at least one, if not two, it's perfectly fine. I mean, whey protein, pea and rice protein, they're just minimally processed derivatives of food. That's the argument I like to make um, in terms of supporting them because I'd rather you have them rather than not get enough protein. And you can get very high quality ingredients that are minimally processed with very few add additives from good companies. Uh, for example, First Form, um, which you can use the link in my show notes for First Form. They have a uh, vegan shake. It's, I think it's called vegan. Um, it's a pea and rice blend. And then, of course, they have a bunch of whey shakes that are perfectly fine. They have a faster and slower digesting shakes. We always want to balance this with real food. So if you're not a big meat eater, first I would say, what kind of meat do you eat? And can you just scale that up and eat more of it or varieties of that and cook it in different ways? Second thing, are you not a big meat eater because you're kind of picky or out of habit? Like, would you be willing to eat other forms of meat just to try them out um, or mix them in with the meat that you like or mix them into a chili or a casserole or something like that? Um, if you're looking for the biggest bang for your buck, it's going to be seafood. It's going to be things like shrimp and whitefish, which are basically pure protein. <laughs> so maybe you don't eat a lot of beef, but would you would you eat like um, shrimp cocktail, right? Just frozen shrimp, thaw them out, eat them as a snack. Ton of protein, right? There's also uh, dairy is a huge source of protein. Cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, um, legumes, and then all the plant-based sources of protein. So there's really, you could get all your protein from food. But the less of the denser proteins you eat and the more proteins you eat that have other things like carbs, which is the case with plant foods, the harder it's going to be to balance the calories in the protein. And then you often need to supplement it with something like a whey, whey casing or um, pea rice blend if you're avoiding, if you're like vegan and avoiding all animal products. So that'd be my recommendation. If you're going to have one or two shakes, you know, go all out and get all the um, grams of protein you need based on the math. So if you're shooting for 30 or 40 grams in a meal or a snack, go ahead and have one and a half, two scoops of protein. Don't just have one scoop. Go ahead and just scale it up to what you need. Okay, next question. How often should you weigh yourself? 
So earlier I talked about how important it is to weigh yourself from a, a data gathering standpoint. Believe it or not, the evidence suggests that regular self-weighing helps with weight maintenance and weight loss and is not associated at all with any sort of disorders unless you had a propensity for that to begin with. And then it gets into that thorny territory that I'm not going to go down right now. But I will say all my clients weigh every day. I weigh every day. And plenty of other people do without any issues. And I think I've said this before, but when you weigh yourself every day, it becomes a fairly meaningless, tiny individual data point. And you start to learn that your body fluctuates significantly day to day. And that those fluctuations have nothing to do with fat, fat gain or fat loss. I was just checking in a client today and he gained two pounds on the scale overnight. And we know that he had pasta late at night and some, a lot of sodium in a sauce. And so that extra salt and those extra carbs definitely gained, uh, caused fluid retention overnight. And I said, look, if you gained to gain two pounds of fat, you would have to consume an extra 7,000 calories. Not going to happen, right? And in his case, he tracks his food and he pretty much is lock on, you know, um, rock steady day to day anyway. So we know that didn't happen. So the day to day weigh ins allow you to see those fluctuations, get comfortable with them, and start to to be like, yeah, I'm confident that that has nothing to do with my my lean tissue and my body fat. So I'm going to c- keep collecting those, and then over a two to three week period, you start to see how that pattern shifts in one direction or another. And that's telling you how your body mass is actually changing. Um, And again, we use macro factor because it has a trend weight based on those daily points. You don't have to weigh every day. You can do it every few days or a couple or once or twice a week, but the more, the better and the more precise, which means faster adjustments, which means you get to your goal more quickly with less um, frustration along the way. Okay. At the end of the day, this is about consistency and focusing on the trend. So related to this is another question. Is there a specific time to weigh yourself? Very simply, yes. The most consistent way is in the morning, preferably, if you can do it, okay, for most people, at the same time each day, preferably in the morning, after you use the bathroom, before you eat or drink. And just wear the same thing every day. Usually for for men, it might be boxers. For women, it's whatever, your undergarments. Just the same thing every day. This also goes for body measurements, by the way. If you're going to measure your waist circumference and chest and hips and all those things, do them also around the same time you would weigh yourself. Okay, next question. Do certain foods affect hormones? So I was thinking about how to answer this question. Because on one hand, I I don't like to use these questions as an excuse to try to uh, explain away why you're not gaining, gaining or losing weight, why you're hitting a plateau, and you're and try to hack every little detail of your food and sort of get obsessive very much like a diet would be where you're like well these are good hormone foods and these are bad hormone foods right we don't want to get it to that level because at the end of the day the overall dietary pattern that serves your goals high enough protein sufficient fats and carbs for energy and recovery um the right amount of energy balance and calories for whether you need to gain or lose weight and then a good blend of micronutrients for your health it's really all you need, and the hormones should kind of work themselves out, so to speak. Having said that, I wanted to bring up a few specific foods that have been shown to be helpful for your hormones, and I'm doing this because I know these foods are the kind of things people just should be eating more of. And you guessed it, for the most part, we are talking about vegetables, uh, lean meats, and high fiber carbs. So cruciferous vegetables broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Um, Evidence shows that they help your liver metabolize estrogen and balance your hormones. Now, these claims I'm making are associated with specific studies. I'm not going to link them all in the notes, but I do have them in my my personal notes. And again, I I don't want you to kind of um, overweight these relationships to say, well, okay, you know, I've, I, my doctor said I need to, you know, I have a problem imbalance of my estrogen, so I'm going to eat more broccoli and that's going to solve it. I'm, I'm not trying to make these types of connections. At the end of the day, I'm, my, my message here is that eating mostly whole foods, 80, 90% whole foods and a variety of them. And if you're picky, trying to be adventurous and incorporate more foods is probably going to be your best bet overall for meeting your goals and um, helping you with things like your, your fat, fat loss, your body composition, your health. 
So cruciferous vegetables, uh, salmon and albacore tuna. We're talking high omega-3 fatty acids. We know omega-3 fatty acids are uh, a good thing to have. Um, it's why some people recommend supplementing with fish oil. Not all. Some of the jury is still out on this today. But we know that there's some linkage with reduced inflammation and improved insulin sensitivity from having these extra omega-3 fatty acids. Again, some of the research is overblown. The ratio of omega-3 to 6 uh, research has, has maybe been overblown as well. But salmon and tuna are very high in protein, is, protein too, so you might as well enjoy them. Keep in mind, salmon is a fattier fish. Tuna is a little bit leaner, and other white fish are leaner as well. So it depends on what you're trying to uh, consume here. Avocados, wonderful fat. They also have fiber. They also have magnesium and potassium. All of these things are great for your hormones. Enjoy avocados. Fruits and vegetables, you can't really have enough of them. We're talking antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, fiber. All of these things are are just well known to be good for your blood sugar, your insulin, your hormones like cortisol and, and other hormones. And then anything with fiber is going to be helpful when you talk about carbohydrates. Oats, quinoa, beans, lentils, right? They slow down um, absorption a bit, which some people argue then when you have them as part of your meals overall, you lower the... the um, what am I trying to say? The the index, the glycemic index, or at least you r- help regulate blood sugar a little bit better. Again, I would say just if you're active, if you're strength training and you're eating a healthy dietary pattern, um, it's going to kind of work itself out. But these are little extra things to be aware of. Now, as far as foods that disrupt your hormonal balance, oh man, you can find probably one influencer per food out there uh, to, to, to bring this up. I'm just going to mention three things. Soy, pesticides, and alcohol. That's I don't want to go down any other rabbit holes. Soy is uh, is a dietary source of phytoestrogens, which is a plant compound that can mimic estrogen in your body. And I used to think that they were just totally off limits because I'm a man and I don't want to all of a sudden start producing a whole bunch of estrogen. Um, but it really does come down to dosage, like many things. Uh, overdoing it on the dose dosing can lead to toxic levels of anything, right? Anything. And so g- I think generally the evidence is that uh, moderate consumption of soy is perfectly fine. We see it from population studies, observational studies, um, cultures that consume a lot of soy. You know, some of the, where you might want to watch out is the soy, uh, soybean oil, just because uh, there's so much of it in everything. Um, but even that, uh, when we talk about seed oils and whatnot, uh, again, may not be terrible. Um, and if, the, if it's a source of replacing saturated fats with uh, poly or unsaturated fats, that could be beneficial. Really depends on you and individual factors. So I just wanted to throw that out there almost to say that, like, don't freak out about soy, um, but you may have heard it as a, a potential hormone disruptor. So look into the research and, and make your own decision on that. Pesticides, we know that those have been an issue worldwide for many decades, and there have been all sorts of regulations, such as Roundup when it comes to oats. My family, for example, buys organic oats because there was a study that that analyzed many, many oat brands and found that the vast majority of them had rather high levels of Roundup, just um, visibly up or you know um, observable right there on the oat. And I'm like, hey, I don't want to take a chance. <laughs> I'm just going to buy the organic. But again, you have to make your choices on these individual things and how much of them you eat. Um, when it talks to organic versus not, you have your budget to consider. You have you know the food environment, how much of the stuff you're eating, and how you're preparing it. The other thing is alcohol. There are there is research that certain amount of alcohol can affect your hormones, the production, the metabolism, the signaling of your hormones. We know that there's nothing net positive about alcohol um, from a nutritional standpoint. So so the less is generally better, but we also know it's part of life and we enjoy it. It's part of social gatherings. I drink alcohol um, a few times a week. Generally, I enjoy it. And there you go. That's life. So these are general guidelines. Everyone reacts differently to different foods. Your hormones are influenced by so many other things, stress, sleep, exercise, genetics, whatever. And, you know, I would recommend go get tested if that's what you need. Talk to your medical professional if you have special circumstances. This is not medical advice. Um, And I hope that answers your question. (laughs) Okay. The next question. Should people be concerned about sodium intake when dieting? So if you go back, I don't have the episode number with me, but I interviewed... Uh, I interviewed Dustin Lambert. He's another coach, uh, great guy, and he's in our group as well. And we talked about this a little bit, and he surprised me a bit because, um, you know, his philosophy is that there's been a a counter backlash against the sodium, the high sodium crowd, meaning um, 
the recommendations generally is to keep sodium less than a certain amount per day. And I think it's 2,300 milligrams per the general guidelines because it's associated with high blood pressure in people who are sensitive to sodium, especially. And there was this backlash like, well, no, that's just because, you know, people who have poor diets and processed foods, they get way too much sodium. But if you're on keto or low carb or a whole food diet, you don't get enough sodium. So you need to start salting everything. And his, his argument was well, that, that we're pushing too far the other direction that you can still overconsume sodium. And so I, I would agree that there is, there has to be a balance. And at the end of the day, I would suggest tracking your sodium using your food logging app, seeing what the consumption level is, compare it to the recommendations. If it's significantly more, okay, then I still wouldn't say you're necessarily over salting, but think about your, how you're eating and whether there's something that contributes a lot to that um, sodium that could be a simple change. And also cross-reference it against your blood pressure if that's what you're doing it for. Before my coaching session with Philip, I was really struggling with staying consistent with my nutrition. Philip really showed me the importance of being consistent day to day. He also helped me see that it's not a bad thing to take a rest day. He really helped me get in that more positive headspace of a rest day being something really good for me. I've been doing this for a month now and I'm finally starting to see some progress in my numbers and I'm really excited about that and I just appreciate so much the help that Philip has given me. He's always willing to answer questions, to offer resources that are totally free and very, very helpful. So I just want to say how much I appreciate that. Thanks, Philip. Like if your blood pressure is perfectly fine and you've been consuming, I don't know, 4,000 milligrams of salt a day for years and years and years, is there an issue? I don't know. If, if we're talking other things besides blood pressure, maybe, but from a blood pressure perspective, maybe you're just not as sensitive to uh, sodium. So sodium is an essential mineral. It is a great, you know, electrolyte to prevent dehydration, but most people get enough sodium. And the question is, are you getting too much? Do the things that I suggested, track it, compare it, cross-reference against your blood pressure. Okay, the next question, do thyroids play a part in these types of processes? And by these types, I think the person asking the question is talking about metabolic processes, metabolism, uh, especially body weight, body mass, which most people are concerned about. And of course, thyroid disorders can interfere with weight management because it is so crucial to your metabolism. And I don't want to get too much into the disorder side of things. I want to talk about just the general um, generally what I see with most people talk, let's think about what the hormone does. Um, it's, I, I like to call it the metabolism hormone or not just me. Others call it that it's, you know, how you consume your, how you take the food that you consume and transform it into energy. The thyroid hormones affect how your cells use energy, how your body burns fat, how it regulates blood sugar, how you maintain your body temperature, many, many functions. Okay. All these hormones are pretty complex. and before we even get into do they pay, play a part in, in metabolism and everything else, just metabolic adaptation when you are dieting, when you're in a deficit and you don't have enough calories coming in for your hormones in general, every all of these hormones are affected in some way. And so, yes, it's going to affect your metabolism down, you know, negatively in a downward direction for everybody, no matter whether you have a disorder or not, okay? And there's not much you can do about it other than eat more food again. And the only way you can eat more food is either reduce your deficit or move a little bit more, right? Have a higher energy flux, walk more, um, not necessarily lots of cardio, right? Uh, high intensity cardio, but just walking more. And then that usually raises your expenditure so you can eat more. And then that helps a little bit with the metabolic adaptation. So what is the, what is the thyroid hormone come from? It comes from your thyroid gland, which is the front of your neck, produces thyroxine, T4, and uh, tri try idothyronine, I think is how you say it, T3. T4 is mostly inactive. T3 is the active form that affects your metabolism. And your, your thyroid gland converts T4 into T3 with the help of an enzyme called di diiodinase. So, I think I, so again, I'm not a doctor, folks. I'm not a hormone specialist per se. I have studied it these quite a bit and help clients with um, when they have sort of what appears to be hormone dysregulation, in some cases it actually is, and they end up um, being on replacement therapy because I do deal with primarily clients who are, I'll say, in their mid-30s all the way up to their 60s, um, and a lot of female clients as well, and you do see this uh, through perimenopause and postmenopause. So I'm not saying you don't need uh, supplementation. That's between you and your uh, medical professional. 
But the um, anyway, so that's that's why I know a little bit about these things. There's this sort of feedback loop system involving your hypothalamus in your brain, your pituitary gland, and multiple other hormones. So there's this cascade. All of these hormones inter- inter- interact with each other in, in different ways. Now, the hypothalamus is the brain, part of your brain that controls uh, things like thyroid releasing hormone. It stimulates your pituitary gland to produce uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. And then that is where we get the T4 and T3 and on and on. Okay. So sometimes the thyroid gland can produce too much or too little. And these cause problems as well. So when we talk about hyperthyroidism, when there's too much thyroid hormone, and then that speeds up your metabolism and causes like causes causes weight loss, causes anxiety, tremors, palpitations, and other things. Then there's hypothyroidism when your gland produces too little. And that's what a lot of uh, people are concerned about because it slows down your metabolism, can cause weight gain, fatigue, depression, and so on. And I've definitely seen this happen where a client will just have these almost inexplicable weight loss plateaus, no matter how much of a deficit we take them into, because that deficit is further exacerbating this hypothyroidism, which further slows down the metabolism. It's like you can't keep up with it. And then when they start um, taking some uh, T3, synthetic T3 or whatever, it all of a sudden goes away. Again, you have to talk with your medical professional about if this situation applies to you. I'm just explaining how important thyroid is to your metabolism. Beyond those, there are definitely other things like nodules and cancer and other things I'm not going to get into. So if you suspect you have a problem, consult with a doctor. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the basics down, like proper nutrition, strength training, let me tell you, strength training, if you're not training and you start lifting, you might be surprised what an amazing effect this has on all of your hormones to the point where a lot of these, um, what express themselves as hype both thyroidism were actually just related to fueling yourself for nutrition and um, working on your fitness and body composition. Okay. All right. Next one. These are a lot of questions in this episode. I realize thoughts on building muscle over 40. Okay. I could do an entire episode, multiple episodes about this. It comes up all the time. People say, well, I'm over 40. What do I do? In my opinion, building muscle over 40 is not much different from building muscle at any other age. Now, I am 42, and I started properly lifting when I was almost 40. So it's not like I've been lifting since I was 20 and just saying, yeah, yeah, everybody gets the same. What's the same are the principles? Progressive overload, right? Adequate volume for you, because everybody has very different volume response. Men, women, different age, different size, very different. Um, The intensity and frequency, the need for recovery, proper nutrition, and of course, individualization. So those are the principles. And if I have a 45-year-old versus a 25-year-old, the same principles apply, but because they are principles, the actual prescription changes for you. So the main differences I see are that older lifters have reduced recovery capacity. It's just a fact. (laughs) It's just a fact. It's just harder to recover. Uh, An increased injury risk, right? Um, hormonal changes that come with the older age, especially in women, it's, you know, exacerbated for women. Slower muscle growth or muscle protein synthesis as we get older. And, and keep in mind, some of this has to do with the fact that we've lost muscle mass through age, especially if we've not been training, right? So it's kind of like a multivariable situation here. So what are some of the modifications for people over 40? Um, One modification is you may have to have a slightly lower frequency for certain muscle groups or certain movements. You may, right? You may not. In fact, I've been in a situation where if I increase the frequency but have shorter sessions, I'm actually able to recover better and get more stimulus that way. So you never know. This is where I'm saying, like, just because you're over 40 doesn't mean it's the end of the game. If anything, it's never too late to start. If you're 65 and you haven't started training, it's not too late to start. If you're 80, it's not too late to start. It's only going to be beneficial for you. Uh, Another modification would be volume, right? And and by volume, I mean sets per week. So trying to play with the number of sets, right? If four sets is just hammering you into the ground, but three sets allows you to recover, sleep, feel great the next workout, then that might be your sweet spot, okay? You just don't want to overtrain and get overfatigued. But don't use that as an excuse not to train hard enough. I would say if you're a beginner, you can train three days a week, full body, go all out, 
and see how you feel and you should be able to recover just fine even if you're 40 or 50 or 60. The other thing is, you know, at at, that, at this age, life tends to get in the way. So and not in the way, but I mean, you have this ideal plan to like lift four days a week and you're going to go nonstop and you're going to build X amount of pounds of muscle over nine months. Well, what's going to happen? You might get injured. You know, you might have family things that come up, stuff at work, you know, death in the family. You might have to go on a trip, business trip. You might have your vacations on and on and on. So many things get in the way. And these are essentially forced deloads. To the point where you may not even need to ever plan in a deload. You just make them line up with these parts of your life. So acknowledging that and coming up with a, and following a program that gives you that flexibility is a good approach because then you won't feel frustrated that you all of a sudden took a bunch of steps back, right? Yeah, I took a week off. Okay, now I get back on and I continue. Similar to this is using programming that allows for auto-regulation. Now, this is a more advanced concept that I really wouldn't worry about until you get about six to nine months in, meaning your first six to nine months, I would focus on just increasing the weight on your bar or your dumbbells or whatever, just getting stronger and using the same sets and reps and just getting stronger. But then as you get more advanced, you get a feel for what pushing hard is and you can use rep-based programming or um, maximum-based or percentage-based programming where What you squatted last, you know, two weeks ago, it may be a different maximum this week, but still feel just as hard. And it allows for you to kind of undulate with your personal recovery ability and your volume. The other thing is, you know, we talk about warm up and mobility and stuff like that. I don't think you need anything fancy, but just make sure that if it's cold, you take a few minutes to warm up with some basic movement, maybe on a bike, right? And that you're always focused on your technique. Anybody at any age can get injured and anybody at any age should be focused on their technique anyway. But just because of you haven't been training and you're older, um, your your connective tissue is less um, flexible or less limber than when you were younger. You may have gone through injuries. You may have had surgeries and so on. I'm just trying to stress that it's perhaps even that much more important that you really dial in your form and technique as you go along. And one of the best ways to do this is to get a qualified coach. Or the second best is to be part of a group where you can do things like form checks um, on your form rather than just doing it in a vacuum and assuming you're doing it right, okay? And then the last thing, of course, always is going to be proper nutrition, proper hydration and and electrolytes, sleep, and stress management to support your muscle growth and your recovery. So building muscle over 40 is 100% possible. Just follow the basic principles of training and nutrition and make adjustments based on your individual needs. All right, I have a few more questions here. The next one is, what is your opinion on EAA supplementation? So what is EAA? EAA stands for essential amino acids. And these are the critical amino acids uh, for muscle protein synthesis. And I would say that you can get enough of these from uh, a well-balanced, healthy dietary pattern. Even though you do, if you're training, you need a, a lot of protein, Okay. Um, you do not, I do not recommend EAA supplementation for most people. I think they're unnecessary. I think they're overpriced. I think you can get all the essential amino acids you need from eating protein and, um, even like whey and, and vegan protein supplementation where you get not just the EAAs, but the rest of the, uh, protein amino acids and everything that comes along with it, the, you know, the calories that are in protein. So EAA supplements, they're marketed as superior to whole protein sources because they claim to have faster absorption rates and higher bioavailability. But I would say most of those are based on flawed studies that compare them to low quality protein sources or unrealistic doses of EAAs, as well as they'll take participants who have a low protein consumption to begin with EAAs and say, oh, look, there's a benefit. But there would have been as much or more benefit if they had just consumed uh, whole protein. So um, maybe they're useful for people who have trouble eating enough protein from food like vegans and vegetarians, but even for them, I'd recommend like a pea rice protein blend I talked about before. Simple rule, right? 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight per day spread across three to five meals from high quality sources like meat, eggs, dairy, fish, whey, or plant sources. (laughs) Stick, Stick to the simple stuff. I wouldn't waste my money on EAA supplements. I don't take them myself. I used to, and I don't anymore. Next question, what's a good resting heart rate? 
Okay, so wearable devices are pretty good at calculating your resting heart rate. So what I recommend doing is tracking that number over time and seeing what happens under two different scenarios. Oh wait, let me ask you a let me ask you a question. Answer your question first. The normal resting heart rate for adults is between 60 and 100, 60 and 100 beats per minute. And the lower end of that spectrum is more common for people with better cardiovascular fitness. And athletes might have an even lower one than that. So I'll give you an example. I was I just had rotator cuff surgery. My resting heart rate while sitting there waiting for the surgery was 45, 46 beats per minute. And they said, oh, are you an athlete? I said, well, I really thank you very much for that. And, and I, it always, I always love when people say that because I never used to consider myself an athlete. I used to be overweight. My resting heart rate used to be closer to the mid 60s. And it wasn't until after, my, after I started lifting and then walking a lot that I saw my resting heart rate come way down. It wasn't from cardio. It wasn't from running. It wasn't from any of that. It was simply from getting to a, a reasonable weight, you know, body mass, uh, from moving and training. And that's it. So anyway, so what I recommend doing is tracking your number because it's really about the relative change. And the first scenario I would do is track it before and after a significant change in weight, like a fat loss phase or a muscle building phase, wherever you are now, just whatever the opposite of that is, and see how it changes. I personally have found something like a five to 10 beat per minute change, which goes down when I lose weight and goes up when I gain weight. Down when I lose weight, up when I gain weight. Very clear correlation. The second thing you can try is before and after you change your training or your movement. So if right now you're pretty sedentary and you're going to start strength training, or let's say you train, but you only get like three or 4,000 steps a day and you're going to go up to like eight or 10,000 steps a day, that's also a great before and after to compare. And just make sure you note when you're doing these things and compare them to your resting heart rate. And you should definitely see an improvement. So a good resting heart rate is going to be around 60 or potentially lower. But again, it's relative to you, your history, all these other factors. And if you can improve it, that's, that's the best. Okay. And then just one more question. One final question is what's the best way to add electrolytes to your water if you don't like flavored water? Um, electrolytes, of course, allow us to absorb our water and stay hydrated. And there's multiple ways to do this. The one I always recommend, it's super easy, is adding a pinch of, of sea salt or Himalayan salt to your water. Salt, of course, is, contains sodium. And then uh, add lemon juice to that because lemon, lemon juice contains citric acid, which helps enhance the absorption of electrolytes. Uh, it also has vitamin C, which you can't go wrong with. So salt, lemon juice. Another way to do it is to just buy off the shelf liquid electrolyte supplements, right? Elements or Dr. Berg's, I think it's called. I mean, there's a whole bunch. Just look at the ingredients. They contain usually multiple electrolytes, sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride. They oftentimes don't have sugar or calories. Some have artificial sweeteners, so it's really up to you of, of what you want there. And you can, you know, pop those in your water after a workout, for example. And then one other thing that I haven't tried myself, but adding some coconut water or watermelon juice as well, because those are natural sources of electrolyte and they would add some nice flavor to your, um, to your water. Wow. Okay. So that was uh, a lot of questions. I think it was like 11 questions for today. Speaking of questions, I wanted to mention something that we just started recently in the Wits and Weights Facebook community, which by the way, is totally free to join. We have something called Ask Philip where you can post a specific question about your health and fitness journey, and I'll answer it live on Fridays with the video replay immediately available in the group. So I want to be clear, this is more than just a general Q&A like today's episode. The Ask Philip thread gives you the chance to get very specific about your goals and where you're stuck, right? Like, hey, you know, here, here are my macros. Here's how I train. Um, here's how many steps I get, blah, blah, blah. And I'm on, I'm stuck at a weight plateau, weight loss plateau. What do I do? Or I've never tracked before. I'm not sure if it's right for me. Here's my scenario here. Here's my goal. What do I do? Right. And then I will give you a very specific answer to help you move forward based on your situation. So if you're not already in our free Facebook community, click the link in my show notes or search for wits and weights on Facebook. Again, just click the link in my show notes to join our free community. All right, on our next episode 91, I will be reviewing the latest research around protein intake and body composition. And I'm going to break down exactly what matters, 
why it matters, the simple steps you can take to ensure you're getting enough protein, both for the minimum effective dose, but also to optimize your results, including some surprising findings from the research. So make sure to follow or subscribe to the podcast, Wits and Weights, in your podcast app right now. Go ahead, click the subscribe, click the follow so you get notified of every new episode. And as always, stay strong and I'll talk to you next time here on the Wits and Weights podcast.